Let's talk about tough love. You ever heard that expression? Oh yeah, tough love is a, is a common expression, is it not? And sometimes we think that it's just sort of a, sort of a recent idea, you know. Uh, your mom and dad may have practiced tough love on you, but they probably didn't use that terminology, though it was tough and you knew it, there was a lot of love in it. Let me tell you how old tough love is. Tough love is as old as God as God dealing with mankind. And sometimes we really, really lose sight of it. We read that verse about God loves us and therefore we ought to love one another. Sometimes we don't even understand what the word love is. How, how would you define the word love? Uh, do you love your job? Uh, do, you, do, do you love your mom and do you love your job in, in exactly the same way? Uh, do, 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 you, do you love your dog? Here all of a sudden is a word that we use over and over again. Uh, do you love Krispy Kreme donuts? Uh, do, do you love food? I, I mean, all of a sudden, here's a word that we use over and, and over again. What about this one? Don't you just love exercising? Now, there are some retarded people here, I think, that, 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 of that, whom that would be true. You know, my brother jogged, you know, three miles every day of his life for, uh, for nearly 40 years, you know. And, and I told Jerry, I said, Jerry, I said, uh, you need to understand that tortoises live longer than racehorses do. And, <laughs> and, and so that gives you some idea. Do you love exercise? Yeah, some folks really, really love it. What's that mean? How do you define love, you know? Uh, what about your car? Do you love your car? And somebody said, nope, nope. I had to put a new alternator in it last No, But there are folks who just love their car and, and they love all of these things. And then there are some folks that love the gators. I'm not sure why, but, 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 but there are those who love the gators, you know? And uh, there are those who love snook fishing, you know? You, under, you understand what I'm talking about? There, there, there are folks that just love everything. What on earth does this word love mean? Now you think about the love you have for your children or the love that you have for your mom and likely it's a totally different kind of love. What about this one? Love your enemies. Do, do you love your enemies like you love your mom? I'm not saying talking about you love your mother-in-law. Do, you love your, love, do you love your enemies like you love your mother? No, well, yes, well, what on earth is this word love all about? I mean, here's this, word, here's this passage that was read to us, you know, and, and all of a sudden, maybe this will help you. You remember when you were young and, and your mom said, when your dad gets home, you're gonna have to have a talk to your dad, and your dad took you into the other room where, you know, he had that torture chamber, and, 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 and he says... Now, I want you to know, I'm doing this because I love you. I'm telling you, you're eight years of age. <laughs> you're afraid to speak up at that time, but you've got a whole lot, to, you know, I, I, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I got a suggestion. You understand what I mean? And yet, you look back at it, and he did do it because he loved us. Folks, We've got to understand how the Bible uses the word love. How do you define love? Well, the, the way we normally define love is some warm feelings that we have for somebody. You know, uh, you fall in love. What's that mean? And you, and you fall out of love. What, what does that mean? Well, I just, I just get the warm feeling in my heart, you know, when it, whenever, you know... Uh, I'm not sure at what age you start having those feelings. Is it junior high? Is it, uh, you know, uh, I was the baby in the family and I thought the reason I went to school was find a sweetheart in the first grade, I, you know. <laughs> her, her name was Barbara Gibbs. She never would even talk to me, but I, all my old brothers and sisters had boyfriends and girlfriends and I thought that was what it was all about. Uh, you fall in love. I just love being with that person. I love shopping. What does that mean? I just get, that, that's not me speaking, by the way. I don't love shopping. <laughs> I don't love the gators either, but that's another whole story. <laughs> but, but, but you guys got to understand something. 
that we use the word love normally to talk about the emotions that we have. And it impacts all of our society. Now, let, me, let me just say this and then I'll just keep on going. And you, if you don't, you know, write this in your head if you don't get it when I first say it. The Hollywood view of love is you live with the one you love. The biblical view is you love the one you're living with. Wow, what a difference of attitude. The, the Bible, you see, I mean, I mean there, is, there is a Greek word that, that's used in the Bible. It is not, and listen to this, it's not the most commonly used word for love. It's the Greek word phileo, and, 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 and it does talk about feelings. But the most common word used for love in the Bible is agape. And it is a word that, that is so totally different because agape, love, talks about actions in my life. And so the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, in that great chapter on love, love suffers long. What's that do? Well, well that's an action. That, that's, a, that, that's how I act when I love somebody. You know, love is not puffed up. What is that? that that's not a feeling. That, that's that's an, a manifestation of an attitude. Love is kind. Uh, that, this kind of love that the Bible talks about, this agape kind of love, is, is the kind of love that, that deals with my actions. And so when the Bible says, love your enemies, and in another place it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. What's your emotional response to that enemy? How do you feel toward that individual who has done you wrong? How do you feel toward the, toward the boss that fired you unjustly? How do you feel toward that individual, that family member or, uh, who, who has said something evil about you? How do you feel about that? Well, whenever you begin, how do you feel about it? That's that other love. How are you going to treat that person? See, Agape love has to do with how I respond and how I treat that other individual. I'm not sure exactly where my feelings would be if my neighbor had, had uh, taken my dog and killed my dog. But if he gets in the hospital, guess what I need to go do? Oh, I, I need to take care. I need, need to help him. If his yard needs mowing because he's got an extended sickness, I can do that. Why? Because that's the right thing to do. That's, the emo that's not an emotion that I have. My emotions may be something else, but here's my actions in relationship to this. And listen to this. If you want your marriage to work, then you agape your husband, you agape your wife, regardless of how they treat you. That's agape love. And somebody says, boy, that sure is tough. Yeah. That's why we want today to talk about tough love. Because you see, agape love does what is beneficial to the other person. Dad, why are you spanking me? Because I love you. It's beneficial. I'm going to mold your character. I'm going to do it. And where my feelings may be, my heart may be broken at, what, at the action that I may be taking toward my son. But it is good for the family. It is the right thing to do. It has to do with actions. And you and I need to understand that. And we need to understand that this really is love. Now, let's see if we can amplify this. Let's look at some examples in the Bible that helps us understand that sometimes love demands that, that we do things that that if we've just left our feel, how do you feel about this? What do you feel you ought to do about this? No. What does agape love say you ought to do in relationship to this? We've already mentioned in, in, in an illustration uh, how, it, how it's seen in relationship, in relationship to, the, to the matter of rearing a child. Uh, are you aware that, that this verse is in the Bible? 
And some of you say, my parents may know that, it, that it's in there, in there too much. Do not withhold correction from a child. That's Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13. For if you beat him with a rod, and the Hebrew says, you know, if you, if you use a branch on him, not a rod, not a beating. That's in our day and age, we, we read these verses and what we hear is child abuse. And we're not, we're not talking about un, without mercy beating a kid. That's not what he's talking about. But it is talking about taking, taking that branch and using it on him, correcting him with a branch. If you, if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. If you beat him with a rod, if you correct him with a, with, with a branch, you will deliver his soul from hell. Austin Jenkins, why did you beat me to death? Because Dan, I wanted you to be a preacher. And I knew left to yourself, you would have been Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> but isn't that right? But that's tough. Young people, listen to me. When your mom and dad have had to discipline you, 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 don't, you need to understand, and you will not understand this until you're a parent, but their heart was aching. And they may have literally gone into the other room and wept. Why did they do that? Because love sometimes has got to be tough. You, you, you want another illustration of it? What about God correcting us? We'll talk more about this if we have time. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. He scourges every, everyone, that, everyone that is His child. And hopefully we'll have time to end the lesson to just quickly look at this passage from Hebrews 12. You know what that means? That there are times in our relationship to God when God looks us in the face and says, you can do better than that. And I don't mean that in a face-to-face -face -face confrontation, but I'm talking about whenever we're reading the Word of God and, the Word of, and there's a verse in the Word of God that says we ought to be this and we think, I don't want to be that way, but I've got to be that way because that's the right thing to do. God wants me to be, and God's trying to correct me. And so Bible study is correction and, and studying the Bible is, is, is correction. Are you aware that the word chastening is used in relationship to the Lord's Supper? Are you aware that 1 Corinthians chapter 11 talks about how when we examine ourselves, we're judging ourselves, and when we judge ourselves, we are chastened by the Lord. When you, ate the, when you ate the Lord's Supper a few minutes ago, did you look inward and think about your own relationship to God? You know what that is? That's God's way of trying to discipline you and, and cause you to look at yourself and see yourself for what you are. God loves you, and, and, and one of the ways he chastens you is just whenever you, when, but I don't like what I saw. That's the feelings that I have. And I, and I need to have feelings like that. I'm not saying don't have feelings like that, but what I am saying is, that, become, that, that, that feelings in relationship to tough love, you, you, you've got to almost, you got to get my heart's feelings and what I want to do out of the way and say, God, you're on the throne. Whatever you want to happen, that's the right thing to happen. Chastened by the Lord. Can we talk about David and Bathsheba? You remember this, the, 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 this thing that is in 2 Samuel chapter 12 when he had taken Uriah's wife. You remember what God did to, to David? He didn't just fold his hands and say, David, you're such a good king and you're the best king we've ever had and you may be the best king that we'll ever have in this kingdom and so because I love you, I'm just going to, just going to fold my arms here and, 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 and just, just sort of overlook what you've done. You want to see tough love? You've taken another man's wife, David. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to take your wives and have sex with them in the marketplace. And your kingdom is going to be filled with turmoil. 
And when, when in the next, next uh, few years there was rebellion against David and more especially the rebellion by his own son Absalom, where's that coming from? It's God trying to teach a lesson to David. Here's the most remarkable thing. Though God forgave David for the killing of, of the husband of Bathsheba, the baby still died. Why? Because wrongdoing has consequences. Sometimes, teens, we t- t- tend to think, well, if I do wrong, I just tell mom and dad I'm sorry, and therefore I don't have, I won't, they'll overlook this curfew, they said. That, oh, no. If they love you and they say the consequences of your actions is this and you disobey that, even though they forgive you and they're glad that you're sorry for what you've done and the promises you've made, there are consequences to action. The baby does die. That's tough. But David, that's exactly what you need to learn. Tough love. I wish we had time to look at Deuteronomy 28 to to look not only at what he did to to David, but what he did to all of Israel. The last verses of Deuteronomy chapter 28 says to that Jewish nation, you go into that land and I'll bless you above any nation that's ever been blessed. But if you disobey me, ultimately here's what's going to happen to you. You'll be scattered all over the world and everywhere you go, you'll be hated and despised. That's tough. Yes, but that's the consequences of killing all of the prophets and ignoring every prophet God sent to them and ultimately killing his son. The worst tribulation that's ever been brought on this earth was brought because of that, and it's tough. Yes, love demands that God look at me and do for me what is best for me. And if he just ignores all of my wrongdoing, Folks, that's not love. And the Bible is filled with illustrations of this. What about Jesus and the money changers? You're a money changer in the temple and all of a sudden here's this man coming in with his whip and he's driving out all of these animals and turning over the tables. Wow, what a violent terrorist he is. No, no. You money changers need to understand you have blasphemed God. And God loves you enough to turn the tables over inside that temple. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. They had the property, they sold it. And I hope you, you know, I hope you know these stories. If, they, if they're up here, write down the passage and go home and read it. If you don't know this story well, sold their property. And and they didn't have to give any money to the Lord at all. But others were doing it and they obviously wanted the, the recognition that others had received. And so they went out and they brought the money in. First the husband brought it in and he said, this is exactly what we got for the property. He was lying. But they wanted everybody to think that we're as good as all these other folks. And, and they lied about the money they had, had sold the property for. They'd kept back part of the money and they came in and they lied. They didn't have to give any of it, but they wanted to have the notoriety and the praise of godly people for what they have done. And when they walked in, Peter said, did you sell this for this much? And he said, yes. And Peter said, you are a liar. You have not lied to man. You have lied to the Holy Spirit of God. And the man dropped dead. That's tough, yes. But the church of Jesus Christ needed to know that, that love is tough. And a few hours later, when Sapphira, the wife, comes in, exactly the same things happens to her. Paul and Elamus, this may not be one as you're nearly as acquainted with, Acts chapter 13, trying to keep, keep uh, Sergius Paulus from obeying the gospel, This man whose whose name is also Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus, which was a common name in that that time. Here's Elamus. You know what happened to him? By the Holy Spirit of God, Paul struck him blind. Why? 
It's exactly what that man needed in his life to sober him up and to change his life. You see, tough love is not God being angry without a cause. It's God being angry to try to get folks to turn back to him and try to correct the mistakes that they're making in their lives. In Titus chapter 1, we read about elders. And I find this amazing of of false teachers coming into the church and the responsibility given to elders of stopping the mouths of false teachers. And I read that, my first impression is, is literal of a child that's misbehaving in worship and the mom slaps her hand over the mouth of that child to keep him from distracting others. The mouth of false teachers needs to be stopped. And that's the reason. Well, that just, that, that, I just don't feel like doing that. Folks, we're not, we're not motivated. We don't live on our feelings. Other than that, attitude we have toward God that says, God, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. You know, Hymenaeus and Alexander, those names ring a bell at all. They're they're in 1 Timothy chapter 1. They were two false teachers. And they, they had said there is no resurrection. The resurrection is past. It's all over with. They were in the church teaching the doctrine of the Sadducees. They were religious people. Whenever you deny the resurrection, they're not like some modernists who are out there saying, oh, there, you know, there is no God, there is no resurrection. These individuals are verbalizing the very doctrine of the Sadducees and they said the resurrection is past. If there ever was one, it's, all, it's already been. There is no resurrection. Do you know what Paul did? Paul writes Timothy and says, those two guys that are there, Hymenaeus and, 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 and Alexander, I have delivered them to Satan. That, that's remarkable, is it not? What did he do? They were individuals that, that, that had come over to, over to where God was and, and then they left it. And in some way, Paul said, I have given these people back to the devil. That's tough. But you see, sometimes doing the right thing is the hardest thing to do. Your husband unkind to you? I don't have to tell you how hard it is to be kind back to that husband. But it's the right thing to do. Does your wife put you down and make you feel like you're less than human sometimes? You know how tough that is. But for you to turn the other cheek and do right regardless of what she does or on the other hand for the, for, to do, for the wife to do right regardless of what the husband does. Do right. And sometimes it even hurts the other person to do that which is right. You think David wasn't hurt when that baby died? You think the life of Hymenaeus and Alexander was not ruined whenever these men who were prominent in the church were given back to Satan? Their influence was not what it used to be. Do you think their life, yes, but love sometimes demands doing things that are tough. We mentioned that expression about giving this one to Satan. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 discusses that in, in, in rather large detail. Now, there was a situation in the, in the church in Corinth where a man had taken his father's wife and this act was so evil, so unheard of 
that even the pagans in all of their immoralities would never even consider doing this very action. That's why, by the way, I think those who want to soften what's being said here by talking about this being a stepmother may have not let read the rest of that verse. Not the pagans wouldn't even do this. And the church at Corinth, instead of dealing with it, they were so puffed up. I have struggled for so many years. You've got this kind of action in the church and the church is proud of it? How on earth in the church at Corinth such an immoral situation that the church could be puffed up about it? I only know of one possibility. If you know of another one, you'd be my friend if you'd tell me. But they're puffed up about their acceptance of others. Their toleration of it. We're merciful. and we'll, 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 we, will, we will show to them the love of God. And Paul says to them, In the last verse of the previous chapter, he says, I'm coming there and I can come with a rod in my hand. I can come in the spirit of meekness or I can come with a rod. And you've got a situation and it's ironic that that's the latter part of chapter 4 and chapter 5 addresses this very situation and says, you folks need to be ashamed of what's happening there. That your toleration, your spirit of compromise And as I developed this lesson, I thought how much the spirit of compromise is based on my feelings and your feelings. And I don't want to hurt your feelings and you don't want to hurt my feelings. And so let's find some little little ground that's right out here in the middle so both of us, we won't hurt quite as much and our feelings will not be hurt. David, the baby is going to die. Sapphira, your husband's going to be killed by God. Elamus, you're going to be blind. And so Paul tells the church at Corinth to come together and to give this man back to the devil in the name of Jesus. Why? In order that his soul might be saved. Hear that. Church at Corinth come together. And we're trying to save this man's soul. And this spirit of toleration and compromise and loving you because, because, well, we're just good folks. We want to love everybody. And the Bible says you ought to love everybody. Yes, you ought to agape everybody. And sometimes agape is tough and hard. But we want this man to go to heaven. And so we come together and we say, in the name of Jesus, we're giving this person back to Satan. They've chosen not to serve God. They've chosen to serve Satan. And in the name of Jesus, we're giving this person back to the devil. And it breaks the heart of the church. But I'll tell you this. It helps folks in the church to understand the importance of purity. Young people, imagine if you were a church, in a, a member of the church in Corinth, and here's the man that is so sexually immoral, it's more, more vulgar and vile than anything that any worshiper of any of the gods of the Greeks would do. And folks say, and you let that happen down there in that church? Oh, no. We live right and do right. Well, do you hate that man? No. We want him to go to heaven. My dad used the belt because he wanted me to be a faithful Christian and live right and do right. And you may have noticed he impressed upon me the understanding that it is always right to do right.
Well, that man, that man may, not, may, may not choose to change his life. That's right. But folks out in the world will look at the church at Corinth and says, those folks are concerned about righteousness. Just quickly. 1 Corinthians, Hebrews chapter 12, when God chastens me, I'm eating the Lord's Supper and I'm chastened by the Lord. I'm reading the Bible and I'm chastened by the Lord. Some brother or some sister comes and says, Dan, you're doing something wrong in your life. How do I respond to that? Verse 6 says, I need to respond saying, I'm God's son. Instead of me being upset because I'm being rebuked by God, by his word, by those who are his children, I need to respond saying, I thank God that I'm a son. Verse 9 says that when God chastens us, we learn to respect him like we learn to respect our fathers, earthly fathers, when they chastened us. Verse 9 also says that when God corrects us, I become subject to him. I recognize that I'm not in charge of my life and that I can do anything that I feel like doing. There's that word feeling again. I can do anything that I love to do. Oh no, God has corrected me and I'm going to be submissive to him. And the reason he corrects me, verse 10, is in order that I might be holy, that I might bear the fruits of righteousness, not to put me on a guilt trip and make me feel like, well, I'm the whole design of the rebuking of God is to bring about holiness and how thankful we ought to be. Love is tough. Whenever I must duplicate in my life how God has treated me in the way I treat others. That's tough. Listen, it's for my good. Does God weep whenever we do wrong? Absolutely. Did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? Absolutely. He wept because he loved that city. And he brought judgment against that city because he loved that city. What a great lesson for us to learn. Let me ask you this. Is God directing your life? Are you, you just sort of playing church? That's not what it's all about. The God who loves us says that we need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. The God who loves us says we need to make up our minds to follow Him. The Bible word to describe that is repentance. And Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says we need to use our mouth to confess that we believe Jesus is the Son of God and then we can be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on his name. And he adds us to his family. And now, having done that, we're his children. And whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And a part of the teaching that he gives to us like my dad would say, I'm going to have a talk with you. The God of heaven says, I want to have a talk with you. Dan Jenkins, you be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. And that's his promise to you. If this church can help you go to heaven in any way, won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing. Will you come?